Today we are discussing the femur, or the thigh bone. Femur is the longest bone within a human body, and it is also the most massive. Femur is a typical example of a long bone consisting of the shaft or body and epiphysis or the ends of the bone, whereas in this case femur is going to have three epiphysis, not just the proximal and distal, but also the third epiphysis that will develop within the area of the greater trochanter. Perhaps in comparative studies it makes sense to also compare the structure of the femur to previously discussed humerus as there will be several similarities between these two bones but also there will be quite a few of differences that we'll find also on the femur. Let us start the description of the femur from its proximal or superior end. As one can see the superior part of the femur is designed to create the hip joint together with the acetabulum of the hip bone. Head of the femur is about two-thirds of a full sphere and is going to be practically completely engaged within the acetabulum, especially when the acetabulum gets addition of fibrocartilaginous rim, the acetabular labrum. The head itself, as you can see it, is entirely smooth. During the life it's covered with a hyaline cartilage, except one little indented area that is practically what we see here. This is what is called the fovea, capitis femoris the pit of the head of the femur. Fovea capitis femoris is not articular surface. Fovea capitis femoris is the attachment point on the femur for the ligament which is called the ligament of the head of the femur. The main role for the ligament of the head of the femur is not really to bring additional stability to hip joint which is regardless of this ligament quite stable but rather something quite unusual because the ligament in this case brings additional blood vessel a branch from the obturator artery that is going to provide additional blood supply to the head and neck of the femur during the lifetime. Once we pass the head, we're finding the region of the neck of the femur. Unlike humerus, femur has only one neck and that one is very much clearly indicated. On the neck itself, if you take a closer look, one can find multiple small openings all of them practically being additional or access renutrient foramina in order to bring additional plenty of small blood vessels in particular from the hip joint capsule in order to provide a little bit better and improved blood supply to the head and neck of the femur during the lifetime. Because this is frequently not the case, that's why in elderly people we are seeing increasing number of spontaneous fractures of what is called the hip. Essentially it's not a fracture of the hip but most likely it would be a fracture that goes across the neck of the femur. Please remember that we are now using the left-sided femur and that's why the image that you have on the screen might be looking like a mirror image of the images that are typically seen in anatomical textbooks or atlases. Therefore this is the anterior side of the femur and we are moving away from the neck, passing from neck onto the body of the femur. Where neck and body meet, it is at a very odd angle, something that really explains why such two massive projections are created at the point of junction between the neck and the shaft of the femur. They're called greater and lesser trochanters. A greater trochanter, as it's illustrated here, is positioned more superiorly and it is probably the most lateral part of the hip bone something that we would normally point to when we want to make a quick reference to our own hip. The lesser trochanter is situated more on the posterior and medial aspect of the bone as it could be seen when I slowly rotate the femur. This is the lesser trochanter. As we just confirmed existence of a greater and lesser trochanters of the femur, we can now take a look and confirm anteriorly there is intertrochanteric line which is mark of capsular attachment of the hip joint, fibrous capsule goes and covers this area. But when we rotate the bone and see it from a posterior aspect, we will find that there is more massive, more prominent bony ridge which is called the intertrochanteric crest. 
that is seen on the posterior side of a femur. Also from this same perspective, we can see that there is a bit of an overhang that the greater trochanter creates above or superior to the femoral neck. This is the area which is called the trochanteric fossa. With additional zoom, we can find out few additional openings also that serve as the passageways for smaller blood vessels from the fibrous capsule of the hip joint to pass into the bone and to produce additional blood supply that this bone definitely needs in a later stage of our lives. On the intertrochanteric crest, we have also a little extra elevation here that is called the quadrate tubercle. Quadrate tubercle is attachment point for the quadratus femoris, one of the small muscles that converge around the hip joint, also known as the intrinsic muscles of the hip, whereas other muscles such as obturator internus, obturator externus, gemelli, are predominantly going to congregate on the surface of the greater trochanter of the femur. Inferior to the lesser trochanter, we will find additional landmark. This is the pectineal line of the femur. The pectineal line is insertion point for the muscle which is called the pectineus, running between the pectin pubis down to pectineal line of the femur. Femoral shaft. Surprisingly for the bone which is considered as the largest bone within a human body, we would have virtually zero landmarks that we can find on the anterior side, on the lateral side, and also on the medial side of the femur. Main reason for that is that this huge femoral surface is predominantly occupied by attachment of three heads of the largest muscle of the human body, the quadriceps femoris. Its three heads, vastus medialis, vastus intermedius, and vastus lateralis, are given ample bone surface and as a result of this kind of interaction between the bone and the muscle, there is absolutely no signs of pull force developing on this massive area of the femur. In a sharp contrast to what we've seen anteriorly, now we will find that there is another quite massive landmark that exists on the posterior shaft of the femur and that one is known as the linea aspera. Linea aspera or thorny line. Aspera means a thorn. Linea aspera is so prominent because other muscles of the thigh really do not have any remaining bony surface to attach to other than this limited posterior aspect of the bone. That's why linea aspera appears to be very sharp, quite elevated, and quite massive bony landmark, practically making it impossible to miss. As we follow the linea aspera superiorly, we'll find out that it starts splitting into two lips, the medial lip, which is directed towards medial side, and the lateral lip of the bone of the linea aspera that will be directed more laterally. The lateral lip continues upward towards the greater trochanter, but it really ends up here on the area of the bone showing also massive elevated parts, which is called the gluteal tuberosity. It is insertion for the gluteus maximus muscle. So from linea aspera, following the medial lip of the linea aspera, we're now going more onto the medial aspect of the bone. This line becomes now known as the spiral line of the femur as it truly spirals from posterior to the medial to the anterior aspect of the bone. And the spiral line actually blends into intertrochanteric line on the anterior side of the femur. Linea aspera also continues inferiorly towards condyles of a femur, but this time we're not using same terms such as medial or lateral lip, but rather use different terminology. Inferiorly, linea aspera splits into lateral and medial supracondylar lines or supracondylar ridges. I believe that it is possible to see them here. I'll just play with the bone in order to show them with a different light refraction. So this is the lateral 
and this is the medial supracondylar line or medial supracondylar ridge. Inferior end of the femur. As you can see it here, shaft of the femur starts showing signs of increasing its width as well as increasing its thickness in order to form distal end of this bone which is known as the medial and lateral condyles of the femur. So term condyle is used to define curved articular surface of the bone and on the medial condyle we'll also recognize medial epicondyle, the most elevated part, as well as the lateral epicondyle also being the most elevated part on the lateral side of the bone. On the medial condyle we will find additional bump which practically reflects itself on the distal end of the supracondylar medial ridge and this little bump here is known as the adductor tubercule. It is the insertion point for adductor magnus muscle which is using this little landmark on the distal femur and joins with part of its fibers group of hamstring muscles. Condyles, as one can see it here, appear to be converging anteriorly. So when they finally converge, they create one common articular surface, which is known as the patellar surface. Patella, or kneecap, sits within this area when the knee is fully extended. So if the condyles are converging anteriorly, then they obviously diverge in a posterior direction. As they diverge, the groove between them becomes significantly deeper and within knee flexion, when the patella is located now in much deeper groove between medial and lateral condyles of the femur, its position is more safely secured and less likely that there will be any kind of issues coming from patellar's improper position. Condyles are covered with hyaline cartilage and the femur, together with tibia, with a little bit of assistance of course coming from patella, is responsible to form the knee joint. So for the end let's just take another look from the posterior direction to the condyles of the femur. So this is the posterior view to the distal femoral shaft and also to distal condyles of the femur. Let's zoom in and let's find out some of the features. Because you cannot see the rest of the bone, let's just confirm. This is the medial condyle, this is the lateral condyle, this is medial epicondyle, this is adductor tubercule. Medial and lateral epicondyles are attachment points for strong collateral ligaments of the knee joint. As the condyles are quite diverged in a posterior direction, they form intercondylar fossa, a deep pit so large that it can easily accommodate presence of my finger in it. The main reason for we have to spend a little bit of extra time and a little bit of extra attention to this detail is that intercondylar fossa actually becomes the attachment point for both anterior and the posterior cruciate ligaments of the knee. The anterior cruciate ligament will be attached on the lateral condyle on a surface that is facing into intercondylar fossa. So attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament is approximately here, whereas the posterior cruciate ligament will pick this aspect of the medial condyle of the femur. So it is medial condyle and the surface that is facing into intercondylar fossa. And for the very end, let's do a quick review of bony landmarks that we've seen on the femur. Starting from the uppermost part, here is a femoral head, fovea capitis femoris, the neck of the femur, the neck of the femur from a posterior direction. While we're posteriorly, let's confirm position of lesser and position of greater trochanter, and in between them, intertrochanteric crest with quadratus femoris tubercule. Not the quadriceps, but quadratus femoris. Trochanteric fossa and a greater trochanter attachment site for 
intrinsic muscles of the hip. On the anterior side, there is intertrochanteric line. Multiple openings that we see here serves, serve to allow multiple blood vessels to produce extra blood supply to the bone. Under the lesser tubercle, we have the pectineal line. And now we're on to shaft of the femur. No landmarks on three out of four different surfaces, medial, lateral, and anterior. But on the posterior side, we're seeing big, massive landmark, that is linea aspera. Medial lip of the linea aspera, which becomes the spiral line of the femur, which ultimately becomes the intertrochanteric line of the femur. Should we follow the lateral lip of the linea aspera, we will go more laterally towards greater trochanter and we will stop on the gluteal tuberosity, which is attachment point for the gluteus maximus. Inferiorly, linea aspera splits into lateral and medial supracondylar ridges, creating a bit of a triangular flattened area, which is known as the popliteal fossa. The term popliteal is used practically multiple times for many structures that are found posterior to the knee. Shaft of the femur expands to form two condyles. This is lateral, this is the medial condyle, epicondyle, medial epicondyle, adductor tubercule on the medial condyle, and common articular surface for both medial and lateral condyle, patellar surface, and then as the condyles diverge, we need to see it from behind, they form deep depression calling it intercondylar fossa, attachment point for both anterior and the posterior cruciate ligaments of the knee.